Thanks so much, Lewis. I wanna welcome and thank everyone who is able to join us for this incredible panel. I'm truly honored to be able to sit here today to introduce to you uh, the incredible panelists. I know that we will get into more details about their stories, but we have Dennis and Judy Shepard. They are the parents of Matthew Shepard, board members and founders of the Matthew Shepard Foundation. And we're also joined by LaVon Bird Harris, the sister of James Bird and the president of the Bird Foundation for Racial Healing. I've had the privilege of working with uh, all three of them throughout the years. I wanna thank them for sharing their stories and thanks to all of you who are watching today. The Matthew Shepard and James Bird Hate Crimes Prevention Act signed by President Barack Obama 12 years ago this month is our nation's most important and powerful tool for confronting hate in our country. This landmark legislation was named after Matthew Shepard, a 21 year old student at the University of Wyoming who was gay and James Bird Jr., a 49 year old black man living in Jasper, Texas. Both were tragically murdered in acts of unspeakable violence and hate. This hate crime law increased the jurisdiction of the FBI and the Justice Department to investigate bias motivated violence and added gender and gender identity based violence to the list of hate crimes. It also removed unnecessary barriers to prosecuting hate crimes committed because of race, color, or national origin and gave the Justice Department new tools for prosecuting criminals. It is a law that we are putting to work each and every day at the Justice Department to confront the escalating rates of hate crimes and hate violence that we are seeing across the country. The law has helped to ensure that those who commit hate crimes are held accountable, allowing all Americans to live more freely and openly. Both the Shepherd and Bird families were there for the White House signing, and I wanna now turn to them. If I could start with you, Dennis and Judy, um, for those, especially young people who may not know the story of what happened to your son, Matthew in 1998, share uh, a little bit uh, with us about Matthew and who he was and how you came to the work that you are undertaking today. Well, Matt was a 21-year-old uh, school in Laramie, Wyoming, the university. He was a giant of a, of a person, five foot two, 105 pounds. He spoke five languages, was taken sixth one when, when we lost him. Uh, he liked to hunt and fish, uh, ride horses, uh, the theater, uh, politics especially. His goal and dream was to work overseas for the State Department, try and bring the same rights, responsibilities, and um, privileges that he thought he had here in America to other countries. And the, the way the foundation started was uh, while Matt was in the hospital, we started receiving donations to help defray the medical costs. And we just couldn't do that. We thought that was our responsibility. And Judy and I and our younger son decided that the best thing to do would be to take that money and use it to help his community, the LGBTQ community. And it, it, so we started the foundation. Uh, it started on December 1st, his birthday, his 22nd birthday in 1998. And it immediately, uh, went went crazy with people supporting it because Judy was Judy was emphasizing the fact that it wasn't just the LGBTQ community that was important in this. It was all the marginalized communities because they're all the intersectionality uh, was such that you were more than one one person. You're in different groups. So it's important that that we emphasize that and start uh, pushing in that direction. And LaVon, I want to turn to you next. Um, your brother, James Bird, was tortured and brutally killed in Texas a few months before the attack on Matthew Shepard. Please tell us about how you remember your brother and what most helped you and your older brothers and sisters and your parents in the days and weeks uh, following his murder. 
James, uh, he was um, older brother. Um, he was very protective of his family, outgoing, loved his music, loved to be with people, he was a people person, entertainer, piano, all around it person. And he loved his family. And um, um, to see him the day before, uh, we thought all was well with the world. You know, before I was seeing more times with him, never knowing that that day before that I would never see him again. Um, and what really taunts me about that night is that um, if only if he was born another race, he would be 50, he would be 70 years old today, join his family and his grandkids. But being of a black ethnic race, they didn't look at him as a person, they looked at him as a black man. And that's all they were looking for. And that's kind of pain, it's kind of hard to hear um, because uh, he had no choice to be born where he was born. But he was remembered as being an outgoing person. And what helped us was the community, uh, local community. Um, the small towns like Jasper, Texas, uh, everybody segregated. Um, and me living in Jasper, I can't experience ever a white individual coming to my home. Um, we just didn't ever experience it unless they're selling something. But the community came together and knocked on our door and sovereign crimes saying, I'm ashamed to be white uh, because it floored them that this is happening in their town. And uh, that gave me a sense of light that not all is bad with the world. You know, not judge all people by color, but saying this race of people hate all people. That's not the way to live life. So there's good and bad in all races. I learned that it was a living experience for me. And the risk assurance that Billy Rose was really the highlight because he came to our home and he said, we're gonna find who did this to your child. My mom in her eyes and said, this would not happen again. And we will not rest until that happened. And two days later, the men were arrested and, uh, and put uh, in handcuffs. And so that gave us a sense of release that this, this is not gonna be slip on the rug. This is something that's gonna really happen. And, and we got people behind us in this, we're not alone. And sometimes communities can either divide a person or bring together. And that time, just the community came together for us during that time. And so they gave us a light that uh, we will, uh, with the support of others, uh, survive uh, this trauma, if there's such thing as survival, because you never survive because it's a senseless hate crime. I, I thank all of you for sharing a little bit about uh, who Matthew was and who James was. It's important that we remember uh, their humanity. And um, I thank you for the work that you continue to do to lift up their legacy. LaVon, your family started the James Byrd Foundation for Racial Healing in 1999. And your foundation also initially focused on education, scholarships, and supporting youth. What drew you and the board to focus on education and who did you most want to reach? And also interested in hearing how uh, your vision and sense of what is most needed and effective has changed over time. Well, during that time, it was like the, uh, the Shep, Shep family said, people was, was outpouring to us and we found ourselves on a more of a counseling type of um, situation because everyone was saying, Things are happening to their family members. How can you help us? How can you? Uh, how can we have a voice? In small towns, we really don't have a voice, and we end up really doing more counseling than grieving. So we had to put away our pain in order to reach out to others. And uh, and we thought about it. Uh, that's true because in small towns, we really don't have an avenue. And when they told us that, can you help us? we realized that we had to do something because James was a people person and he would want us to reach out to others. And so uh, uh, we started the uh, James Bird Foundation uh, just based on that reason first. And then we realized that um, it goes further than that because there's other people who needs help that's carrying burdens and carrying stories that's been held down for years and years and years and they put it down to their children. And we try to reach the older generation because that's the people who really carry these problems and trickle it down to the children and children like sponges. And when they hear something, 
they receive it, then they have the same problems and pain that, uh, that was handed down to them. And we feel like if they have an avenue to reach these, then they will be able to help others. And so the foundation was designed for education because education is the key to hate. Uh, because people, uh, you're not born to hurt, it's a hate, it's a learned behavior. So anything learned can be unlearned. And, and people often fear because they don't know each other, they're separated, they don't communicate and knowledge will help them to understand that this person, uh, even though it looked different than I am, uh, they are individually have something good for society. And uh, so our foundation had an avenue for that. Uh, we found that uh, through our oral history project, so many people, as they told a story about how hate or discrimination affected their lives, then they end up healing once they tell their story. And that was the generation that we feel like that needed it most because uh, uh, kids is like a sponge from their parents. And, and that helped us a lot to uh, uh, be able to reach the people who really carry the hate around. Uh, then now we got a new generation. We got a generation of young people now that may be under 20 uh, and maybe 21, 22. They never heard of Jasper Tresses, never heard of, of James Bird. So now uh, we're trying to find ways to reach them in a way before it get too late and try to not let them carry what's sitting to them to another generation of people. Uh, so right now, you know, we, we collect a lot of stories and we're hoping to house these stories, but that was the main project because people fear each other because of lack of knowledge and education. And once you feel like I know this person and this person is not harming me and we're on the same page, we're all Americans, we're all human, one race, that's a human race, and let's get along with each other and not cause division. And the purpose of the foundation is to break down the racial barriers that separate us. And so we're hoping to make that bridge better. Yeah, we know that bullying uh, inside our nation's schools, uh, bullying on college campuses, the targeting of young people who belong to pr protected classes is very much a real issue. So thank you for the work that you're doing to promote tolerance and to make sure that people uh, know uh, the story uh, of what unfolded in Jasper, Texas. We need not ever forget uh, Judy and Dennis, I want to turn to you next. You both also started a foundation uh, following the tragic murder of your son. We talked about it a little bit, but hoping you can elaborate more about what the Matthew Shepard Foundation is doing today to prevent hate, bullying, and harassment of young people. And uh, talk about uh, the importance of uh, educating young people who are targets uh, for hate and what they can do uh, to, to push back. Well, we, we also started in the education realm, thinking we could change people's hearts and minds just by telling stories, making it a human issue, not really an abstract issue. But the gay community operated sort of like in the dark for so many years and was um, secretive necessarily because it was against the law to be gay and many things for many, many years. There was a, a built-in prejudice to the gay community. When we tried to get into schools to talk about what it meant to be gay and, and what it really was, try to, as Levon said, get rid of the ignorance about what it meant to be gay, um, schools didn't want to have anything to do with us. They don't want to talk about the gay issue when we find that still to be true, which in particular to the gay community and schools leads to the bullying and the ignorance that exists on our city streets. So we're just not allowed to talk about it in a public forum that would raise people's um, empathy towards the gay community and what they've been going through. Not at all like racial issues, but issues that are um, based on, I don't know, ignorance, secrecy, uh, people's ideas of what being gay really is. It's not, it's just, they're just people who just wanna have a chance to live their life freely. And now in today's world, People are coming out younger and younger and schools have to figure out a way to deal with that. We found that our organization was much too small to go into that. So we relied on larger organizations focused mostly on the gay community, uh, GLSEN and uh, the human rights campaign. We just became an arm, a voice for them um, and the foundation sort of turned into this whatever anybody needed us to be. And in the last few years, 
especially, um, hate crimes became less important to the administration in the last few years. And we tried to step in um, to educate law enforcement, particularly about hate crimes. Also too small to do that really. I'm really happy DOJ is back uh, into the world of investigating and prosecuting hate crimes and identifying them and helping educate communities on what they can do to report those crimes themselves. Um, it has been a, a road, as Lamont can attest, to trying to erase people's ignorance, to educate them so they no longer fear what is different in their eyes. But in reality, we're all different to somebody. We just can't seem to make the leap that we're all equal. Thank you for the important work that you both are doing through the foundation. Um, you know, you dealt with tragedy, but I know that in many respects, the tragedy uh, that you all have experienced was compounded by a backlash uh, that you all faced after there was publicity uh, surrounding the deaths of both James and Matthew. Both of your families certainly received a ground swell of support, but we also know that you were subjected to threats, uh, name calling and horrible abuse. Judy and Dennis, you were targeted by hate groups, even at Matthew's funeral. And Levon, I know that the KKK came to Jasper, Texas to hold a rally. So wondering if you could share what impact this onslaught of hate has had on you and your families, including your relatives who were children or teenagers uh, at the time. And interested in hearing your thoughts about what advocacy organizations and local community leaders can do to assist others who may be targeted with this kind of abuse. Uh, I'll start. We did have the Westboro Baptist Church at Mass Funeral. Um, I didn't even know who they were until Mass Funeral. Um, and I think we sort of made them famous and all their um, less than kind activities through the years. We, began, we, got, we got faxes that were just horrendous, threatening, not us personally, but the community at large. I think because of the way we lost Matt, they would not attack us directly, but certainly they did go after the gay community um, at large. Even legislatively, uh, legislation that definitely attacked the gay community began to rise. Um, groups that felt they were um, against the gay community for whatever reason, uh, they began to organize and take steps to further uh, put down the gay community. But the gay community responded in a way that I don't think anybody expected. Maybe what happened to Matt was the final straw. They just, you're just not gonna do this to anymore. We are who we are, we're fine. We're just like you, except that we love someone of the same sex. So what? We're here, we've been productive members of your community forever, of the world forever. And communities began to take notice, those who supported people as people. Um, but, you know, there were threats, certainly, and it took us years to decide what to do with Matt's ashes. We were so afraid of desecration and further vandalism, that would have felt like someone murdering Matt all over again. So when the opportunity to entomb Matt in the National Cathedral, Rose, we thought this is absolutely the perfect thing to do because he's protected now forever, but people also will have a place to visit him. And it will allow them to be part of the church again. Yeah. Levon? Um, of course, for James, um, it was heartbreaking. Um, very sad when we went out at the KKK, came to Jasper and they white robes and sheets as if you know, no one and no law can stop us because uh, we have the freedom to do what we want to do. And like Judy said, it's like uh, killing James over again because letting the world know that nothing can stop us from doing what we want to do. Uh, and we feared that day because we had his nephews, his children, and, and never experienced a march like that. Uh, and they was there because uh, the Black Panthers was there. And, we had both groups uh, divided and we had to make a decision that uh, no blood should be shed. So we had to make a statement that we're not on either side because 
uh, we got backlash from both sides, the Black Panther for not standing up with them, walking with them, and, and the KKK for not uh, just for who they are. Um, but we had to remain neutral because hate is hate in any words from white to black or black to white. Uh, we wanted to get into the um, um, either side um, because no more bloodshed because James' blood uh, was already for us to bear, and so we just feared the children, and and to understand that these I mean these groups um, they don't care who you are as a person. They don't know your brother, a father, a uncle, any. They was there because as long as you a certain way different than they are, they there to stand up for their rights and. I feel like they shouldn't have any rights because when you speak in division, freedom of speech should be taken out of the, the form because uh, you're dividing the country and dividing the world and we're not uniting the world. And so that's one of the things that um, local thoughts to think about, you know, they do have freedom because they live in the United States, but the freedom they say is, are we going to have them to speak hatred to divide the country? That is something that they really, really consider. Um, but we was afraid that day and, and, and all of that pain came back over again. And then going through the trials and, and things, there was no um, resting because they still got calls and saying, you know, they're in our lives and everything. And, and we felt like uh, there was nowhere to turn to because there was no law for it against us. So we felt the law has failed us, failed James, and there was no uh, hate crime at the time. And so we felt like we had to really just remain neutral and, and rely on our faith to get us through the situation, but um, uh, it was a hard thing to go through at that time. Well, thank you for your courage standing up to the KKK. We know that the FBI recently identified um, white supremacist groups as an ongoing threat in our country today, and that there's still much work to do uh, to confront this threat, this ongoing threat. After the tragedies suffered by your families, your advocacy, your power, your voices ultimately led to Congress uh, passing the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Hate Crimes Prevention Act. And I know that you uh, all were there uh, for the signing of the law 12 years ago this month. Um, in addition to this important law, Congress recently passed a new hate crimes law, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act and the Jabara Hire No Hate Act, which honors two additional victims, Khalid Jabara and Heather Hire. And interested in hearing your thoughts about what the passage of uh, the bill uh, and the two subsequent bill means to you. And how did the campaign that you all led to enact the Hate Crimes Prevention Act into law, um, uh, what, what, what proved most critical and central into Congress passing the law? You all are veteran advocates and community leaders. And so what advice do you have for others that are now embarking on this work? Well, so it, um... I was so enjoyed when I found that the bill was passed because it's very much needed. Uh, because the problem we have in society is that no one have accountability of statistics of how many hate crimes there are. In small towns, uh, I'm sure there's been a lot of people who got away with crimes that never been reported. And this would put a, I guess, a number behind the people um, because we was fortunate that Billy Rose, it could have went a different way. He's a sheriff and he looked at that hate crime and he said, this is beyond my control. He could easily be in a redneck and say, okay, you know what, I'm gonna call this a bad hit and run, you know, and, and be done with it. But he did the right thing by saying, this is way beyond my control. And he reported it as a hate crime. And because Texas at the time did not have a hate crime bill that's strong enough to make any convictions. And so I was happy about this bill because now there's accountability. And I would think that once they find a city or a state, especially the small towns that you have a repeat defenders that continue to have hate crime increase that we need to find out what areas are and get to local, local government and, and see what's causing this increase um, and make them accountable for it. Because uh, I think the South and small towns are really getting beat uh, a lot about hate crimes, no one reporting it. So therefore no one knows about. And then now they think all's right in the world because this town's a good old town which is really not because they have the power to cover things. And I always appreciate Bitter Rose for doing the right thing for us. 
Now, that's a one case by itself, but over the world, you may not have those same type of uh, police officers or things of that nature. And when you're fighting for something, you got willing to go through the stomach box to get what you need because it's not gonna be easy. And uh, I admire all the people who worked so hard to get this bill passed because now we see numbers behind the crime and then there's accountability behind that. And so I encourage all the advocates continue to work hard and continue to pursue because uh, you're the voices now. All the victims, they can't speak right now. So we're their voices right now and have to be able to something happen to their family. These are something in place. A lot of times we do laws after things happen. We be, need to be proactive before it happened. Now we got the Matthew chapter James Bird Act, but it's after the killing of two great people in this world. It took that to bring the attention to America. But now I think we should be more proactive to let statistics know that crimes are still alive and well and we need to get started on making a difference and, and do proactive, not reacting. Judy and Dennis? We, we have felt that the major flaw in the Shepherd Bird Act was not a enforced reporting. We don't really know where crimes are happening without numbers. No numbers, no problem, right? So it didn't, uh, it didn't, it didn't mandate reporting in communities and when large cities tell us they have no hate crimes, we know that's not right, but the further passage of the two recent bills, um, reporting is more encouraged and also funding for training of law enforcement, which we have always felt was critical to enforcing um, the Shepherd Bird Act and now the other two. Um, but Wyoming had no hate crime laws. Many states did not cover the LGBTQ community and their hate crime laws. Unfortunately, Wyoming is still has no hate crime laws. The only state in the union that doesn't have anything called the hate crime law. Um, but is it because nobody lives in Wyoming? Is all small towns, as LaVon keeps saying, small towns, they tend to single out whoever feels is different. We just need to think about where all this is happening and the numbers will show us where it is and show us how we can direct our resources to correct it, um, to deal with the problem. So. You know, it was a hard, it was a hard 10 years after Matt was lost to do this and James Bird too. And I, I think, I hope LaVon would agree with me that what really changed the course was having a president of the United States who understood injustice, who understood that all people are created equal and that all avenues of law should be treated the same. All people should be treated the same. And I just think that that's really what woke up and allowed other people to talk about this in a way that was more equal and more equitable for everyone in America, not just the chosen few. Um, and it, you're exactly right. The underreporting of data is a huge problem. It creates barriers for law enforcement at the federal, local, and state levels who are seeking to figure out where to deploy resources to confront hate. Um, it inhibits efforts to undertake preventative action that can help to prevent hate. Um, and we'll be talking more about this problem later in the program. Um, we are just about out of time. And I know that uh, Judy and Dennis talked about the fact that Matthew's ashes are now interred in Washington, DC at the National Cathedral. Uh, I know that didn't happen until 2018, 20 years after Matthew passed away. LaVon, your brother's grave in Jasper, Texas, is now surrounded by a fence because at some point vandals came and desecrated the cemetery site. Just curious, as we prepare to close, did the city and community support you and your family after that happened? And is there anything that made uh, a difference? And how can community groups respond to this kind of hate? We know that um, Emmett Till's uh, memorial site, uh, you know, was also targeted uh, and desecrated. So I'm just interested in hearing your views about what happened after that fence went up. Well, um, as reality, uh, once this happened, uh, this grave was desecrated, nothing happened. Um, so it happened, I was in Washington during the time and uh, visiting President Clinton. And once he found out that the grave was desecrated, he made the call to Jasper. And he said, in lieu of how James died, this is, this is against the law. We need to find out who did this. And uh, that's the reason why Jasper got involved. Because again, small town, okay, 
so what they got the grave and you know you did and they desecrated so we just move on but president clinton made that call to say no you can't move on you have to find out what happened and and we never heard anything about the investigation or anything so uh we decided that uh they came together and said we need to put a fence around his grave to protect it because it was desecrated twice and nothing was done no one was arrested and um and so we had to do the next best thing was to put a fence around his grave. And so it's very heartbreaking because at the end of the day, uh, he's still impact. He's still encaged because of hate and he can't rest in peace. And I feel like officers now should uh, take accountability uh, of hate crime gra graves, that people die that way, that it should be a federal offense if you come in and desecrate that grave, that you should have the same capital punishment they do for the person who they killed. Um, uh, and the Jasper, they tried to get together and they had a fence that separated black graves from the white graves. So symbolically, they got the fence and they tore the fence down. So now to say to the world, we're all equal. But as to date of my awareness, I don't think any black person have been buried in the white grave and also vice versa. And so a lot of things are done symbolically just to get the pressure off of them. But when all the lights are gone, it's back with the same thing. So uh, 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 we felt better uh, that at least he's safe right now, but that's not the end result. And, and so now I think if any grave should be desecrated and the person was killed based on hate crime, it should be a different punishment than just, okay, just strip it on the rug and nothing can happen. I want to thank everyone for joining us, but I want to especially thank Judy and Dennis Shepard and Ms. LaVon uh, Bird Harris for sharing their stories and insights with all of us today. Uh, I know that I can speak for everyone listening when I say that we have learned so much from you today. We are grateful for your courage, your voice, and the work that you continue to do to lift up the legacies of your loved ones. The Shepherd Bird Act is an important reminder of the legacies of Matthew and James. And it is a tool that allows us to keep working to confront hate violence and intolerance in our country. History has been marred by periods of conflict, hatred and prejudice, but as a nation we endure and we overcome and your courage and resilience are a powerful example of the greatness of the American spirit and of the principles that truly lie at the heart of democracy tolerance, justice, and equality. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for the work that you continue to do. So grateful to have had this time with you today. Thank you. I'm so pleased to welcome Jay Greenberg, Deputy Assistant Director of the FBI's Criminal Investigative Division to uh, today's event. I wanna thank him for his leadership and for speaking with us today. At the outset, I wanna say that I am proud of this administration's commitment to combating hate and to ensuring a fair society, regardless of race, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, or any other protected characteristic. As the leader of the Justice Department Civil Rights Division, I have made it one of my top priorities to combat hate crimes and hate incidents. To that end, we have the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Hate Crimes Prevention Act, the Fair Housing Act, the Church Arson Prevention Act, and more to use in our efforts to confront hate. I'm committed to doing everything in my power to ensure the vigorous enforcement of these critical civil rights laws in our work to hold perpetrators of hate-motivated violence accountable. As you've heard, this is a priority for the administration, our attorney general, and Justice Department leadership. The human and moral cost of hate violence have been tremendous. From the massacre targeting Latino victims at a Walmart in El Paso, Texas, and the tragic killing of Ahmaud Arbery, to the killing and attempted murder of Jewish congregants at the Poe Synagogue. These are incidents that we have charged as hate crimes. Just days ago, a Texas man was sentenced to 280 months and imprisoned 
for targeting gay men with violence in the Dallas area. And in June of this year, a man in Louisville, Kentucky was sentenced to life in prison for murdering two black patrons at a Kroger store and the attempted murder of a third. And just last month, a man was sentenced to 53 years in prison for bombing the Dar al Farouk Islamic Center in Minnesota. These are all cases that we could not have pursued without the help and support of the FBI. I'm gratified to know that Deputy Assistant Director Greenberg and the FBI as a whole have also made hate crimes and incidents a top priority. Uh, you're gonna hear about the launch of several new FBI anti-hate initiatives this summer and fall. And we'll be talking more about what else the FBI is doing to stand up to hate. Uh, so welcome, Jay. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thanks for having me, Kristen. So let's first start off by talking about the new data. The FBI 2020 hate crime statistics were released on August 30th. And I want to talk about what the statistics uh, show. Um, we know that hate crimes in 2020 rose to the highest level in nearly two decades. We also know that we're still struggling with law enforcement reporting at the local and state level. There are lots of gaps. And so the data is important, but we know that it doesn't show the full picture, but it's nonetheless really critical to understanding the patterns and new trends that we are seeing in the country. So I wanna turn the floor over to you to provide a picture of what we've learned from this latest set of data. Okay, thank you, Kristen. And I do want to say, sitting here with you in 2021 and talking about bias-motivated crimes that are rising across the nation um, is, is a, it's a sad point, right, for us that we are here presently talking about how these continue to rise over time. This is certainly a trend that we are working very hard with all of our law enforcement partners to include Department of Justice to reverse and this is something that we take very, very seriously. In terms of the data from 2020, what you're seeing again is a, uh, the highest levels we've seen in nearly two decades. And the statistics themselves are showing approximately the same annual breakdown that we have historically seen, which is that of these bias motivated hate crimes, the majority of them over 60% were a bias against race or ethnicity followed closely thereafter uh, by religion and then uh, orientation, identity, gender. So uh, what we've continued to see is that the same victims, uh, victim communities that have been victimized in the past by these crimes continue to be victimized. We have seen a rise in the report of the crimes, which is sort of a dual-edged sword. While we're happy to see uh, that, that we are getting an increase in the reporting, um, those statistics are, in fact, stark reminders that we have a long way to go as a community. I want to make sure that those who are uh, participating in this conference walk away with a good understanding of how the FBI carries out its work. And uh, people may have noticed that the FBI recently launched a new platform for analyzing hate crimes this year. Can you talk to us about why the FBI created this new uh, platform and what you're hoping it will accomplish? Absolutely. So the new platform that we've created called the Hate Crime Data Explore page is an opportunity for everybody who's out here listening to us or who sees about this in the future to go through and look at the statistics for themselves and break it down in a way that's meaningful for them. So in the past, we provided static reports that broke down the data based on everything that we thought was important. And we showed those same categories and topics every single year. But this is a much more interactive system now. And anybody who navigates to our hate crime data explorer page can actually run the reports that are meaningful to them broken down by specific department, by area, by region, by crime type, because we believe that seeing the data in a way that the community wants to know about themselves is in fact very, very important. So let's talk about uh, one of the kind of consistent critiques that we hear about the FBI's annual hate crimes data. 
Um, there's often a lot of skepticism about whether law enforcement agencies are reporting accurate and complete data on hate crimes that have occurred in their respective jurisdictions. We heard a little bit about this from some of the uh, panelists uh, a moment ago. Um, for example, over 12,000 law enforcement agencies affirmatively reported zero hate crimes, including 65 agencies in cities with populations over 100,000 people. Talk a little bit about um, the gaps in the data and what can be done to make improvements. Sure. So the FBI is committed to continuing to address this persistent problem with, with reporting of this data. Um, we all believe, I know our community members believe, and we in law enforcement believe that this is an area that suffers from su substantial underreporting of crimes. Um, what we're doing here is a couple fold. The first is this year we have embarked, and I know we'll talk a little bit about our, our reprioritization on civil rights here in a little bit, but we have embarked on regional trainings where we are bringing together the FBI offices with all of our local and state partners, our prosecutors, and our community members in various regional conferences. We've held four thus far this year. We have another couple on the agenda for uh, the next couple of months. And one of the topics that we cover during that two-day training is, in fact, the importance of reporting. And then we actually go through the mechanism of how to report this accurately going forward, because we do see it as a law enforcement mandate to really drive that reporting so that we have what we believe to be closer to the best visibility of the crimes that are happening across the nation. One statistic we don't normally talk about that I think is worth mentioning here as we talk about the reporting aspect is that over 90% of the law enforcement agencies across the nation have less than 100 sworn officers. And the reason I highlight that in terms of reporting is that reporting for hate crimes violations normally happens after the fact. In law enforcement, we respond to a call for service, whether that's the FBI, but more frequently, it's a local law enforcement agency that responds to that call for service. And we know that there's been a violent attack we know that there's been assault. We know that there's been property damage. It may take an hour, a day, a week. It can take months before we actually prove that the motivation for that crime, if it does, comes back to a bias. And so what we're asking our law enforcement agencies to do is to prioritize whenever they find that there's a crime that's been committed and we show that there's been a bias motivation to go back to those records and update them to appropriately capture that bias as a motivation for the crime. So for instance, let's say that there is a violent assault. That assault gets reported right away in the system by the police department. They file their records, they send those in. It may be some time, it may be until we get to a person's social media accounts or until we get a statement from other people who knew that subject that we find out that there was in fact a bias motivation behind that crime. And so right now, it's very difficult, particularly for our smaller departments, to go back, to have the resources to go back and update those reports. That's exactly what we're asking them to do. So um, language matters. And you know, one of the things that we often hear uh, from the public is a bit of confusion about how we talk about and think about what qualifies as a hate crime. And what we think about and qualify is a hate incident. Um, you note that the 2020 data shows an increase in the total number of hate crimes. Um, and um, you know, at the same time, we know that there are groups like Stop AAPI Hate who report that from roughly March through December of 2020, they received information about 4,500 and 48 hate incidents. For 2020, the FBI reported less than 300 hate crimes against this population. So how does the FBI explain that gulf, that difference? Yeah, good question. So we talked a little bit earlier about needing to drive integrity in our data and believing that we need to close a gap yet between the number of crimes that are committed, the number of crimes that are reported. So that clearly is an area of emphasis for us and our law enforcement partners. The Uniform Crime Report captures and what we publish 
is law enforcement data that is pushed to us from law enforcement departments from across the nation in regard to crimes that are committed. That is where there is a specific violation of a statute, local, state, or federal, that would meet the definition. That's a hate crime. A hate incident, however, involves all of the interaction between various people in a community that may involve um, disgustingly bigoted language or epithets that are used in conversation or unkind exchanges. Those can be reported as hate incidents. If you think about living inside a community, if even if that's not a crime that is being you know, put upon you as a citizen of a community, if somebody uses, if somebody says something unkind to you and certainly refers to something as immutable as your race or your religion or your national origin, that's not a community that, that our community members want to stay in. So that's really the discrepancy. Hate incidents are simply disgusting, bigoted acts that are unfortunately normally covered by First Amendment protections. Whereas a crime is something where there is a threat of violence or actual violence used with a biased motivation. So a follow-up question here, you talked about language and epithets. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the range of indicators that might lead an FBI agent out in the field to look more closely at a hate incident? What are the factors that might lead uh, an FBI investigator to suspect that an incident may in fact be a hate crime? So there's three primary mechanisms that we use to uh, know that something has happened in our community. The largest percentage of our uh, cases come to us from referrals from local, state, and federal partners where we are contacted by somebody who says, hey, we had something happen in the community, we need you to know, or we would like you along to help us investigate this or to look at it from your angle. There's also direct calls from the community. And so today, one of the themes I certainly want to emphasize here for everybody in the audience is that if you see something or you hear of something, please report it to us in law enforcement. That report can come straight to the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI or online at fbi.gov in our tips area. Or you can call one of our local state um, or federal partners and they will refer it to us as well. So we can get referrals straight from our partners. We can get a call straight from the community. And sometimes we read about this in the media and we realize something has happened where we have an investigative interest and we wanna make sure to execute that in concert with our local state um, or federal law enforcement partners. So those are really the mechanisms that we get these what we typically would see if we see damage to any kind of religious institution or to any reproductive rights clinic, or we see threats against people based on their um, all of the characteristics we've discussed, race, sexual orientation, religion, ethnicity, um, origin, et cetera, then we will reach out if we see that report and we have not heard about it. Previously, we'll reach out and establish contact with that investigating agency and the community who's being victimized by that potential crime and see if there is something that we can do to help. So um, just to, to push a little bit further, I want to make sure that uh, those who are watching understand how critical the FBI is to partnering with us at the Civil Rights Division to seek justice in these cases. The over the past six months, the Justice Department has charged more than 17 defendants with federal hate crimes. Uh, and uh, we're gonna show a slide uh, in a moment that reflects the nationwide scope of our hate crime charges from 2016 to 2020. And I wonder if you could briefly discuss how the FBI works with the Civil Rights Division on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of developing an investigation from the ground up to the point where it becomes a prosecution. Absolutely. 
So Kristen, as you know, is a longtime civil rights prosecutor, and I have uh, investigating civil rights in my history as well. When we receive an allegation of a hate crime or another violation that falls within our civil rights program, those also include color of law, which is abuse of official authority by a government employee, and a freedom of access to clinic entrance investigation. You know, today we're talking about hate crimes, but I want to make sure we don't lose sight of sort of the full program of civil rights that we investigate. So anytime the FBI receives information about one of those different crimes having occurred, we reach out immediately to our local U.S. Attorney's Office. We reach out to the Civil Rights um, Division as well at Maine Justice. And together, we form a collaborative team with our state and local partners and prosecutors to look at all of the elements that are under investigation. And that's really where we come together uh, with ideas about what would a full investigation look like, recognizing we have to meet all the elements of that crime. There was either a threat of violence or an actual use of violence. It was motivated in a bias and it was willful. And so we have to show all three of those things in court to be able to get to a guilty verdict and uh, to bring justice to um, a victimized community or a victim uh, victimized person. So uh, that's really what we would do. We would reach out and civil rights at U.S. Attorney's Office and local partners would be engaged from day one in everything that we do. These investigations all move forward in different ways based on the facts that we have at hand. However, we bring a collaborative team approach from a federal and a local or state uh, partnership, as well as prosecution from all those levels. And really, the Civil Rights Division brings expertise in this area. So that's why we like having prosecutors from your division involved with us on each one of these cases, because they're the most familiar with case law, with typical defenses, and then how to overcome those defenses through an airtight investigation. Yeah, I, you know, I know that the FBI also operates by designating certain threat priorities, and those may change periodically. And just recently, the FBI made a major and significant change in how the Bureau is addressing hate crimes. The Bureau actually elevated hate crimes to the highest level national threat priority. Can you explain to our audience what that means and why it's a significant change? Yes, so historically we've been using internally the same system for about a decade to rank the priorities of different crimes that we investigate. And going back over that time period, we've only ever had one national threat priority, which is one most important criminal threat against which we deploy a substantial number of our resources. Uh, this year, in the wake of seeing everything happen last summer with the violence in and around lawful protests and sort of all of the uprising community-wide, uh, nationwide in our different communities, we realized it was time to sort of break with form and to have a second national threat priority. So we pushed civil rights up to our highest banded threat level or our highest threat level commensurate with where we uh, put public corruption. And by its very destabilizing nature, we have no appetite for public corruption in any of our communities. It's been a national threat priority for a number of years now for us. But we realize that we need to find a new way, a better way to get out and better connect with local partners as well as communities. And so going forward this year, what you can expect to see are a couple of things from us. Uh, and we'll talk more in detail about this, I'm sure, but we'll be launching a national anti-hate campaign through the media. So we'll be using all medium uh, that we can there, whether it's billboards or radio, podcasts, TV, um, any way we can reach community members directly, we'll be reaching out. Each one of our field offices will amplify those messages. So we here from headquarters are pushing out the themes for that engagement with all of our communities. And then each of the community, each of the offices that's located in you know, different states and cities will be tailoring that messaging to their population that is under policing so that we can most appropriately reach out to the communities where we have direct connections. We'll also be establishing out greater outreach with all of our law enforcement partners through each of our field offices, as well as here nationally from headquarters. And we'll be reaching out directly to communities and community groups. So I would invite everybody who is taking the time to dial in today and is clearly passionate about this topic. You know, if you don't hear from us, don't, don't, uh, don't wait around for us. Please feel free to pick up the phone and call your local office 
let us know that you're interested in being part of the change that you want to see in your community. And we, we welcome you in for this discussion. You know, I think the, um, you know, building out partnerships is uh, really important. Uh, establishing those ties with uh, local organizations and advocacy groups, I think is really critical to advancing this work and just wondering how, how is that process going so far? Have there been hurdles uh, and challenges? Um, talk a little bit about how uh, this has been playing out. Sure. Um, there's really two hurdles, I think, that we could point to right now or challenges that we're experiencing every day in our outreach. Um, the first is, and it's pandemic related. Um, these are very personal issues for us as Americans, uh, for us as law enforcement officers. And what we find is there's no substitute for face-to-face -face interaction and personal interaction when we need to talk about painful topics with our communities. So uh, because of the pandemic, that has really constrained, you know, law enforcement has been going out in communities for the last 18 months or so, almost exclusively to deal with reports of crime or ongoing threats in the community. We haven't had as much time to sort of deepen and strengthen our relationships nationwide as we like to do. You know, now with sort of the vaccine um, coming out and us seeing the numbers drop everywhere, we are very, very optimistic that that barrier to personal engagement is in the process of being lifted. And so we expect to have a great deal more personal interaction with our communities everywhere they live so that we can develop those ties. And then the second barrier sort of ties in thematically to what you heard me refer to a couple of times, which is that we in law enforcement, we, we have to do a better job of building trust in our communities. We have to be willing to listen. We have to be willing uh, to hear hard truths. I was at a diversity event a few months back and I was hearing from largely the African community, African American community nationwide, that we need to be ready to hear some hard truths about, you know, how how they feel like we have not adequately represented their interests in the past. And I'll tell you, that's hard to hear in 2021. But having something hard to hear doesn't mean it's untrue. It just means that we have to be willing to hear that, and we need our communities willing to say it so that we can build genuine trust-based relationships and move forward together so that we're not talking about this in 2050. Yeah, I think that history of um, distrust is indeed very real. And I'm glad to hear that you are having open and frank discussions with communities as you engage them about um, some of that history and figuring out how you move past it and, and move forward. Um, we cannot talk about hate crimes in 2021 without talking about white supremacy and the rise in uh, the number of white supremacist organizations that we are seeing across uh, the country. So I wanted to ask you to talk about the FBI's assessment of the threat posed by uh, white supremacists and what is the agency doing that's different to confront this threat? So white supremacy is a topic that we would uh, put together in our domestic violent extremist threat. Um, it focuses on racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists who really want to uh, commit criminal acts or destabilize based on their ide ideology that one race is better than another or one ethnicity is less than another. So to that end, we have a couple of efforts underway. The first is going back several years now, we have a connection here at headquarters and in all of our field offices, whereby we take our domestic terrorist um, investigative resources and we link them with our hate crimes uh, investigative resources. That creates, just by linking them, it means that we bring the strengths of each to the table and the relationships of each to the table. We collaborate on every investigation that comes forward. And where we would see ideology to sort of destabilize a community or to attack an entire community or really a conspiracy um, that wants to use violence to hold a specific community or ethnicity down, those would normally be worked through our domestic terrorism lens, but always in concert with our civil rights investigators and prosecutors for subject matter expertise, um, perspective, guidance, and input. And on the other hand, where we see hate crimes occurring, what we typically see in our hate crimes, and this is borne out again in the reporting last year, is that hate crimes are almost always unplanned, spontaneous acts of one person or a couple of people against a specific 
um, target of opportunity or somebody who's identified as vulnerable. Where we see that kind of act uh, take place, we investigate that through our civil rights lens, but always in concert with our domestic terrorism agents and teams looking at it, determining if there's anything else that can be exploited to sort of broaden what the motivations were or were there others involved so that we're addressing specific acts, but we're also looking for, are there any ideologies underlying this, which we also need to address through our means. Mm -hmm. I wanna come back to a point that we made about building community trust and talk a little bit about diversity within uh, the FBI. And, and just curious if there are any observations or reflections that you can share about the FBI's um, new outreach efforts and anything that you can share about efforts to increase diversity within the FBI. Sure, I'd like to highlight a couple of items on that. The first is when we talk about connecting with the community and building trust, we need to be able to meet the community where they are. And oftentimes, if we wait until an incident occurs, we're meeting that community when they're in crisis. And that's when in crisis, people tend to draw in and become more insular and protective. And that's very natural. So a big um, adjustment for us, or one of the points of emphasis for us going forward is to reach out to those communities in times of peace and develop those relationships so that when a crisis occurs in an area, we're not talking to a community leader for the first time. We have a relationship that is based in trust already that we can leverage and they know that when we're calling it's not a nameless you know government call coming it's somebody like me reaching out locally that already has a relationship with them and is here for their best interest to that end we have over 1300 linguists in the fbi that speak uh, that represent over 100 languages so if that community that's being victimized you know prefers to use a language besides english we can meet most of those needs critically and right then, and if we don't have the ability to do so, we'll leverage our state and local partners and we'll leverage uh, contract linguists as well so that we can connect with a victim or a victim community in a way that is very real for them. In terms of diversity, um, you know, the FBI holds diversity as a core value. It's something that we talk about all the time internally. We have advisory committees internally. I'm an executive sponsor for our American Indian Alaska Native Advisory Committee. So what that does is it, it coalesces around a community um, group. And then those members of that community have executive sponsors like me representing their interests, getting messaging out to our communities, getting messaging out to the FBI, helping us make sure that our diversity perspective is very, very broad and represents everybody under our policing in the nation. And then two, we know that we as an organization need to look more like the communities we serve. So we right now are putting an emphasis on recruiting employees in all, uh, all variety, whether it's professional staff, our intelligence cadre, or our agents who look like the communities we serve and come from the communities we serve, because really having a diverse team makes us stronger and it will make, I believe, communities more willing to work with us when they have something difficult to tackle themselves. I appreciate that. And uh, you spoke about language access, which was another question that I had for you. So I think uh, uh, pleased to hear about the ways in which the uh, agency is prioritizing uh, the ability to communicate and engage with communities regardless of language uh, and language ability. A final question for you. And uh, for those who are watching, those in the audience who want to do more to encourage victims to report to hate, uh, to report hate crimes, um, you know, what advice can you impart? Uh, what can advocates do when working with someone who has been the target of a hate crime or a hate incident? What steps should they take? Sure. So the first step that that person needs to do or that community group can do on behalf of a potential victim is just reach out to us or reach out to their local or state law enforcement. Obviously, we can be reached at 1-800-CALL-FBI or online at fbi.gov. And uh, the first step is them reaching out and letting us know that there is a community that is in peril out there where, where we can provide support. Sometimes our investigations are successful at the federal level, and sometimes we see a hate incident versus a hate crime. But the community doesn't have to dissect that. The community doesn't have to know whether it's a hate crime or a hate incident. That's our job. And even in the case where 
we're unable to bring a federal prosecution, there may be some victim services that we can provide or that our state and local partners can provide in terms of taking care of that community. Because as we um, say out loud all the time, Kristen, and you know this well, every hate crime that's motivated in bias is an attack against an entire community and not just an attack on a single person. And we're here to support those entire communities. So the last point I would make is we, we have seen in the past as a barrier to reporting fear that immigration status may be a limiter on which communities um, will report crimes to us. I just want to remind everybody in the audience that we're not the immigration police. Uh, when we come out, we're looking at the victims exclusively as victims. We take a very victim-centered approach. We have to report any victim services that, um, that those victims are due, and we must provide them uh, by law. And that is something that we take very, very seriously, and we look forward to the opportunity to provide for all of our communities. Thanks, Jay. Um, I could not agree more. Um, hate crimes are not just about the individual targeted. They are about the entire community, the, all of the communities that are impacted when these crimes play out. And it is in part why uh, we make fighting hate crimes such a priority issue for us in the Civil Rights Division at the Justice Department. I want to uh, conclude by saying that we started this briefing by talking about the 2020 hate crime statistics, but behind every one of the 7,759 reported crimes is an individual victim who may have been targeted because of their race, religion, national origin, their gender, disability, gender identity or sexual orientation. And again, at the same time, that individual victim may have been targeted in order to send a message, a message intended to create fear and terrorize entire communities. So I wanna thank you, Deputy Assistant Director uh, Greenberg for your commitment and for leading efforts at the FBI to focus both on the individual and community impact of hate crimes and incidents the Civil Rights Division looks forward to continued partnership with you and all of your colleagues as we embark together on this new chapter in fighting hate. I'm hopeful that uh, this discussion helped to provide the public a greater understanding about how the FBI uh, approaches hate and how the FBI works with uh, the Civil Rights Division in standing up to hate. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kristen.